Well, welcome everybody. And uh, if you want, just uh, take a little time to see each other on the screen because that's part of the taking refuge in Sangha and saying um, hello or mingalaba or aloha. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. Very great taking refuge in Sangha. Supportive, or meant to be supportive. Great. Glad everybody made it. Glad, Steve, that you got on. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, great. Okay. Hmm. I'll just uh, um, acknowledge that uh, we're doing a really, I think, really interesting retreat um, and experiment in that some of the people attending this session have um, been doing a Meta weekend. And so this is, there'll be another sit after this, but there's a Meta weekend. And then some of those people are doing a month long retreat. A lot, a lot of them are doing the month long Brahma Vihara retreat. So they're continuing on. And then a lot of the people doing the weekend will be coming to next weekend, uh, the Compassion Weekend. The next one will be the Empathetic Joy. And then the last weekend, in the last week, right? There'll be a Metta Week. Um, Metta weekend, Compassion Week, Compassion Weekend, Mudita Week or Empathetic Joy Week, Empathetic Joy Weekend, and then Upeka Equanimity Week and Weekend. And it's um, very wonderful. Just like, uh, it's so, we're off to a great start. And um, so today's instruction will be a little bit of Vipassana and Metta. So we'll just get grounded in the moment to moment six sense store awareness right now, asking you to get in a comfortable position to sit in and to just really get a sense of your visual body, like it, what comes to mind when you bring your attention to your body? Is it visual? And if you can start shifting that, it's not bad or wrong to have a visual image of your body, but we ask you to just see if you can let the awareness connect with whatever sensations, physical sensations are happening. So for example, asking you to just let your attention settle in with your hands right now, whether they're folded on your lap or on your thighs. And it's not like you're meant to notice a bunch of different sensations you might, but it could be that you notice warmth or coolness, heaviness, softness. And it's, it's like we're more looking at a very detailed weather map of maybe thermal images of warm and cool, but it, it's not a visual image again, but just giving you that sense that there's this amazing changing flow of sensations within our hands. And then as we settle in, just taking the time to let the sensations wordlessly emerge just as they are. just as texture and vibration.
And already I would ask, the quality of your awareness, is there any tenderness of connection with these sensations? or any kindness or care with a connection with these sensations? Or can there be? And if there is, you see if you can let that tenderness, kindness or care It can surround your hands or infuse the sensations in your hand. We can have the, a phrase, may I be safe and protected. feeling into how that might feel in your hands, safe and protected. Or you could just have that wordless abiding here without words, but kind. And you might let that way of relating come into your arms. And so it's the first noticing the visual image and then the physical sensations in the present moment, just as they are. Might be a few just on the surface of the skin can be vague or clear. And then out of that grounding in the Vipassana, we bring in the metta. The kindness, the care, tenderness, which can be very quiet. It doesn't have to be intense. Very light tender awareness. We can go into our neck and shoulders. into our face. Again, we often have an image, which is then letting that be, no problem, sinking into a little more of the sensations in our eyes. So very simple, tender awareness, nothing more. Just enough. Our 
our ears. And if any sounds or, or silence are happening, you shift to the sound as vibration, texture, and kindness, care. nose and mouth. What can be really interesting is this way we can include thought appearing can be images, black and white, color, texture, vibration, the sound of a voice, your voice, or others' voices. And you just are kind for the thinking itself, not specific thoughts, but just general, can we care about thinking like we would our body? Maybe inside our head or a little outside, it doesn't matter. Infusing thinking with kindness. Down through our upper chest where we can really Find our heart center, we can touch our heart center, receive the kindness there. The mind, the heart. Just receiving the kindness, the tenderness. This includes emotions, happiness, sad, grief, anger, fear, happiness, joy, compassion, metta. excitement, enthusiasm, it's again that just receiving tenderness with whatever appears. Infusing Sound, thought, body sensations, emotion. Down through your back, abdomen. With this wonderful breath at our belly. Just one breath with some very light tenderness. A 
or maybe another one. Again, remembering to receive sensations in our legs, feet, toes. Quietly, you can quietly abide in calling up just that meta field of kindness. No inside, no outside. And when your mind wanders, just come back to quietly abiding with kindness with whatever appears. Moment by moment.
there's a poem by Li Po, one of the old greats from China. He was born in the, uh, he lived in the 700s in China. And I think this is um, an interesting title. He said, after climbing Pa Ling Mountain in the West Hall at Kai Yuan Monastery, offered to a monk beyond this world on Hang Mountain. It's quite a title, yeah. <laughs> you know you're entering a very sublime world. There's a sage monk on Hang Mountain. The beauty of five peaks, his true bones. Autumn moon alight in a sea of water revealing his 10,000 mile heart. A guardian gone into Southern darkness, pilgrims of the way, I'll visit him there. Sweet dew sprinkling down, a language clear and cool, gracing flesh and hair. Bright lake, a mirror of fallen heaven, scented hall, a gate into all this silver. Come for the view. I feed on kind winds, new blossoms teaching mind this vast. It's a very important poem <clears throat> to revisit in troubled times. And I, I think this is such an integration of the metta and vipassana, love and wisdom, just wanting to mention, do you think of your body, your bones, the beauty of five mountains, right? The peaks of five mountains, that's his body. Do you think of your heart as a 10,000 mile heart? Do you feed on kind winds? Do you get that nourishment and give it to others? The kindness you share, offering that nourishment. New blossoms awakening, new blossoms, teaching mind this vast. So we, we do live in interesting, turbulent times. And um, when we talk about metta, it's important to acknowledge it. Uh, but also there's so little time to go into some of the meaning of these kind winds uh, that uh, I'm not going to go into specifics of these times right now. That doesn't mean I'm avoiding it. Uh, Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj said, in the book, I Am That, a great Hindu teacher that's no longer alive. He said, all that you need is already within you. And I think sometimes that we get so disconnected from that, from that truth. All that we need is already within us. And so a lot of the 
the practice, the way is learning how to heal that disconnect from our inner wisdom, our own inner wisdom, our own inner loving kindness. And so learning how to simply come back, bringing back the attention that has wandered again and again to a kind energy field, right? To um, first, it might feel like we're coming back to the pain of this disconnect, but then we bring in the kindness, right? Whether it's with a thought, whether it's with our body, whether it's with our emotion, whether it's with something somebody else said that was unkind or some difficult news or difficult pain in the body. You come back with affection and tenderness. And this relaxes everything. It relaxes the heart, the mind, the body, this willingness to face this disconnect and then go to the loving kindness. And maybe in these moments, we can breathe again, right? Be, be, have the courage to take another step to um, recover this inner wisdom and inner metta again and again. And the loving kindness practice teaches us that when we can't do that, it's often helpful to um, connect with another being. Um, to reach out, to connect with a dear friend or to connect with a um, tree or a plant or a dog or a cat. Or um, for me, sometimes it's uh, the bufos. There are these beautiful big toads that live in Hawaii. Um, and um, I mentioned this, I think, Friday uh, in the talk Friday, but um, Steve and I have had the joy of looking at some holiday lights that Jesse put in this big tree in this field that all the neighbors have been delighting in uh, as well as, as us. And the other night when I was coming back up the driveway, I saw this bufo um, staring at the lights of the of the the beautiful lights in this tree. And I, I took the time to sit down with this bufo and share this delight. It was so moving. And then that was told about that Friday. Last night, um, I was walking up the driveway and um, the holidays are over and the lights weren't on. <laughs> but the bufo was still there. Like, and I and he looked at me like, you know, so where are the lights? You know, what happened? You know, and so I sat down and I'm like, you know, there's going to be some lightning tonight and there's, you know, clouds, but tomorrow night there might be stars. You know, I just sat with the bufo for a while. It was looking at me like, no, not, <laughs> not impermanence, not with these lights. It was great, but a lot of the neighbors are saying that too. Where are the lights? Um, but it's like, yeah, it's impermanent, you know, and so, Working with love and wisdom is, is really the, a lifetime of exploration, of understanding um, that no matter how much we connect, what we connect with is impermanent. You know, this is this, it's the great balancer. That's why if you kind of went through the instructions, is, just a little while ago, it's like grounding in that first, grounding in that inner wisdom where you're noticing the physical sensations changing or the, or the sounds changing or the emotions changing or the, the thoughts changing. This is all really important in terms of love not being sticky, not getting so attached um, that we can't bear how things are. So taking time to connect with other beings, not only, not just um, 
ourselves, but the metta practice moves from really learning how to care for ourselves, but to other, other humans, and then all humans, all other beings in the, in the deva realm, in the joyous realms, in the hell realms, in the difficult places. It's, it's really meant to become all-inclusive and boundless. And of course, that means that we have to include pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, gain and loss, fame and disrepute, praise and blame, <laughs> on and on. So of course, the Vipassana practice, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It helps us have an, a deeper and deeper understanding of how things are, the, this range of joy and sorrow, and helps us accept that this is the truth of how things are, of impermanence of the unreliability of experience because it's changing and then this this amazing insubstantiality of um, what's appearing that if you pay attention to it it's coreless but also it doesn't exist by itself so in that that um, disenchantment that can happen with the insight practice, it, it really is meant to lead to the understanding that it's nothing is worth being attached to, but that doesn't mean that we don't totally care about it. And this is the great paradox, right? That it's easy to say, well, <laughs> we're disenchanted. We don't, we, we don't need to care about it. We don't need to connect. Or that we connect so much, it becomes sticky and we want to control it rather than face how things are. This is from um, Po Chu Yi. He is another great old Chinese poet, and he wrote this. Um, let's see. He lived a, just a little later than Li Po, the late 700s to the early 800s. He wrote this when he turned 66 years old. Sickness reveals a mind weakening and age the rush of light and shadow. I came back home here at 58 and now I've already turned 66. Hair a million bleached silk streaks, pond grass eight or nine times green. Children are suddenly full grown people and garden thickets, mostly tall trees. I gaze off high rocks into mountains. I trace streams back to bamboo depths. Never getting enough of this, at least, this rippling sound of water flowing. So this, this loving kindness practice, the, this connection with the water flowing is meant to hold us through the insight into impermanence, unreliability, and insubstantiality. It's, it's like when the water comes out of your tap, do you do metta for the water? When the food comes into your mouth, are you like the, this is this is the practice this isn't far away from us it's like clouds do we have a relationship with clouds do we have a relationship with cement <laughs> do we have a relationship with tar like it's like wherever wherever we are it's like we tend to get so cut off from relationship of tenderness and kindness. And often I think it's because we're looking for something more intense, more sticky. It's like we, we, we need something so intense rather than a very light connection with all that lives. 
it's so interesting. And I think that I see when we practice over time, that need for intensity to yield something to us that we're so desperate for becomes less and less because we have it inside. So the, the Brahma Vihara and loving kindness practice is helping us um, find this care, this tenderness, this kindness, understanding that everything will die, right? It's like, wow, what a noble task. It takes such courage and it, it um, insight does not into impermanence again, anicca, dukkha, anatta is not meant to stop the caring process. It's meant to actually help us see how precious life is and how interconnected it is. It's like, we all know at this point, it's like what we do in our backyard or in our neighborhood or right next door is going to affect the whole planet and the whole universe. That's how interconnected we are and how moving that is in terms of our responsibility for cultivating these relationships with kindness. And so it's that sense of doing the best we can to relieve suffering, to care until our last breath. So because of the few of the questions that were asked this morning in the um, weekend month-long group, it's, um, I wanted to just touch base on the near and far enemies of loving kindness and remembering that um, the translation of this means that the, the experience that seems so much like loving kindness, this unconditional love, and I'll better go into it a bit more, that we're not focusing on behavior with the loving kindness practice. We're focusing, focusing on the newborn heart in all beings. The newborn heart is taking birth every moment, right? It's like, each moment is new. Consciousness is taking birth every moment. And so we're, t we're really tuning into the felt sense of a being uh, in the loving kindness practice. And so the experience that can seem so like it but isn't is any kind of attached love, romantic love nostalgia it's you can feel my hands are going like this it's it's sticky it's there's and so this does not mean that romantic love is bad or attached love is bad or nostalgia is bad and this is where we can get very confused it's it's just a mere definition that one is without conditions a, a meta is without conditions that's the that's the definition. So when we're putting a condition onto a relationship, that doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. It means it's not meta. And that's so important for us to understand. And then the experience that is the opposite of this connecting with this tender care without conditions is anger. And again, we can take that and we, most of us are so conditioned to think that anger is bad, that then we can start to, again, use the practice against us. The opposite is being said in the, when we integrate Vipassana Metta, it's like we're, we're saying that the Metta can help us know how to um, receive the information of the anger well, know how to work with it with kindness so that we can discern how to work with that particular information. So often we start with the near enemy, but I'm starting with the far enemy, the um, anger. And I, I was sort of motivated by a question this morning, two questions. Um, uh, but as I'm saying that the behavior 
is often that we're upset with is often motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion. So in the loving kindness practice, we use the mindfulness, the Vipassana to when we're feeling separate, when we're feeling angry, often it's important to step back and just get that, what are we angry at? Are we angry at the newborn heart in this being? No, we're angry at this behavior that hurts and is, you know, whether it's greedy or, you know, motivated by fear, aversion, delusion, it's like, that's what we're upset at. And it's like always helpful to remember that we have that too. And that, uh, um, Because our learning has often been that anger isn't okay, we often have to go through the step of, again, Vipassana practice where we're able to just, just like with a sound or a sight or a smell or a taste with anger, it's like, oh, you know, the resistance to the anger is so painful and it often causes us to hate or blame or resent ourselves if we're angry at ourselves or others and we'll kind of get caught in the thought process of blaming and hating and we don't learn we don't know how to work with the anger we don't take that information and we can't discern if we're needing to act or not well so that sense of um, being able to first except that anger is usually unpleasant it's you know it's coming from something that hurt if you go deeply into it it's like ow this really hurts there's a lot happening in the world now that hurts so much and it's like okay like take a few breaths into the heart center and it's like accepting that the anger is happening and then often when we accept that anger is happening, we think that means we're condoning behavior. We're condoning what's happening. No, it just means that what, has, what is happening, we're, we're seeing, we're accepting that this is happening. Even though it's, the behavior is unacceptable, it's actually happening. And we, we need to shift back to accepting the, what's happening inside in response to it or reacting to it. I hope this is clear because it's important. Metta does not mean we're condoning anything that's not right. And it doesn't mean that we don't take action to alleviate suffering or to stop behavior that isn't okay if we can. But it's, it's again, the metta practice isn't focusing on the action at this point. The action is on healing our own heart in response to it meaning we, we, we heal the disconnect with the anger and we heal the disconnect from the hurt. We heal the disconnect from any fear or grief. So again, as you start to shift to, there was a question about um, our bodies and if we injure our body or get old, that we can hate, hate our body and resent it. And really, if, if you haven't had that experience, you're not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> because it happens. I mean, it often happens if you have the karma, body karma of having a lot of hard stuff when you're a kid or get older, but really no one escapes the old age part if you get there. Um, and it, it's just if you look at when we're upset with our bodies and hating it or resenting it, um, it's a good thing to look at a tree or a plant or just something where you can see that there's no perfect tree. There's no perfect plant that, that's like, you'll see disease, you'll see insects, you'll see where uh, the winds hit it hard, or especially in this yard, where the winds hit it hard or the, the drought happened or too much rain or whatever. It's like, this is us. We're the same. We do not have perfect bodies. Um, and, and the ways in which we can look in the mirror and go, oh, you know, oh, you know, just, oh, oh, just, 
you can either walk fast by the mirror, <laughs> don't have a mirror. You know, I have the lights down really low now at night. It's like, you know, don't want to make it too bright, but it's like, whatever it is, it's just like, wow, where, where does this start? I remember when I was young teaching and I would look out at a big group of people, yogis, and I would notice I was conditioned not to see the old people. And it was horrifying. I was probably 33, 34, and I was looking out and I'm like, oh my God, like it's so painful to see. I wouldn't even see, see anyone. And you, probably some of you have noticed over the years, but the, my early years of teaching, I would make sure I would look at every single person, whether there were 10 people or 100, just like, no, I am not going to fall for this. This is not okay. Do you see? It's like I had that sense of like the kindness, but also that kindness took me to seeing that um, I was hurting myself and others. And it was so painful. I think we're most of us are conditioned when we have something go wrong and I mentioned this Friday too that something went wrong with my right eye and it's like the other night when I finally took a warm warm cloth and just put it on my eye I was so amazed that it took so long for me to be kind physically right to really just take some warmth into that part of my body and and take a look at yourself it's like how long do you go in the routine of day-to-day -day stuff and when you hurt yourself it's like how much care do you take with it or do you get you know like when are you going to get better <laughs> like what's wrong with you when are you going to get better right it's just uh and we do this with so much with with so much i'm br bringing up our bodies but with people's emotions with their hearts with the young middle age old it's like the human world is difficult and to to be able to trust that the loving kindness practice even it doesn't have to be intense it's very very light the practice with not so difficult things and people helps us when it gets difficult. And if you can't do metta, we're not saying you have to do metta all the time by any means. You shift back to your, the ground of the Vipassana practice. It's not like you're trying to force yourself to be kind. <laughs> you call it up and see if you can be kind. This is um, from a book of Japanese death poems by Anse. He died in 1725 at age 69. He said, a parting gift to my body, just when it wishes, I'll breathe my last. He was a haiku master and there's a tradition of writing a death poem. So just, just think of how much he cared about his body. A parting gift to my body, just when it wishes, I'll breathe my last. And of course, there's millions of more things to say about anger, but again, just to check to the sense of is it my anger, uh, how identified with us it, it, with it are we, the more identified, the more separate we feel from ourselves or others. And to know again, like I did with the hall and noticing people that I wasn't noticing, it's like it takes practice to start to see where um, 
we can get a better and better relationship with anger, a, a relationship of compassion, care, and um, wisdom, rather than then shunning it and letting it have great power over us. And it's, it's the same with attached love. Again, it's, it's, it's this way in which we're taught, you know, how to work with all these things and the, the stickiness of attached love. Again, it's not bad or wrong, but we learn with attached love to work with the stickiness to get to the unsticky. So you're choosing with attachment to stay with the relationship and I can guarantee if you stay with a relationship, it often will get less sticky. Why? Because when we have an idealized version of a relationship, the romantic love or the idealized love, it's like it doesn't include the unpleasant parts of the person, right? Or the cat or the dog or anybody. It's like anything. You know, you know, the, I, didn't, I didn't mention that the bufos are all getting into my potted plants and they're killing my seedlings. They kill my plants in the garden. So it's not like I've idealized these bufos, right? I have pleasant experiences with them and I find that deep unconditional love. But I have a growing relationship with these bufos in my life here in Hawaii. And it's the same with your relationship with any human being. It's like, when we get this idea that somebody shouldn't be unpleasant, take a look. What is that? Should somebody always be yielding pleasant to us? And what is that? Is that love? So the question is already always, what is love? And I think that way that we offer the loving kindness practice, um, Steve, this morning, Jesse, before, it's like to look at receiving and sending when we're doing that practice. And if we tend to have a hard time sending, to look at, well, what's going on there? And wanting to receive love, it's okay, right? It's like, when it becomes that yearning and then that intense dependency, again, it's not bad or wrong. We all have that. And it's the same with anger. We have to take a look. Of, hmm, can I be interested in this experience and pull back from the object of the yearning, pull back from the object of the dependency? And usually you'll find that neediness or the wanting to be special, wanting to be seen, it's often under a lot of romantic love. Not bad or wrong, but starting to take responsibility for it so we don't, <laughs> we don't injure the being that we're trying to be so sticky with, right? Nobody can yield that for us. So coming back to all that we need is already within us. And this is a, a pretty intense um, quotation from Sri Nazargadatta, but I feel like it's so important. Um, Feeding on kind winds, right? Just feeding on kind winds. You look at our planet and all the pain and suffering and just making all of us making that commitment to tasting and finding that, that unconditional love within us that it's already there. We don't force it, but we, we take the time to cultivate it that look how much it's needed. And then there's the wisdom side. Once you realize that all comes from within, that the world in which you live has not been projected onto you, but by you, 
your hair comes to an end. Without this realization, you identify with the externals like the body, I love this. Okay, so he's calling the externals. You identify with the externals like the body, the mind, society, nation, humanity, even God or the absolute. All of those are externals and they're all escapes from fear. It is only when you accept responsibility for the little world in which you live and watch the process of its creation, preservation, and destruction that you may be free from your imaginary bondage. This is so important. It's like the loving kindness is so important and the Brahma Viharas, and it holds us, it holds us. It's the container for this wisdom, right? We're building this identification every moment that's a prison. Ah, you, me, ah, you, me, my body, my emotions, my country, my world, my God, my absolute, right? It's like all, a all an escape from fear, all a prison. And so what we are offering is both we're really offering that we need this loving kindness so much <laughs> it's like we can't face how things are so anytime you can't face how things are what do you need metta compassion mudita equanimity we need it so much and to value both and to know that we can do this we can we can go through this all together to our deepest freedom. And I, I'm gonna add one more. Um, <laughs> I'm calling this a lighter note, but you'll see. <laughs> but it's, it's really also important. It's from Mahatma Gandhi. When I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they seem invincible. But in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always. That's wisdom, it's understanding, timelessness and impermanence and love. So let's just uh, sit together for a minute and then we'll say a few, few words to end. So we're so happy all of you could come to this sitting that we're all together. And um, we, for the people, the weekend people, the one month people, we're gonna have a sitting at uh, four o'clock Hawaii time. And uh, 
please, the Sunday sitters, please come next Sunday. Uh, we'll get through another week. <laughs> Jesse, is there anything else to say? Okay. And Steve is sending his meta on another page. Hope you all take the time to say hi and, um, as we're ending. You know, take the time to look at each other as we leave. It, it's a visual image and there's a felt sense in there and uh, we all need the support. Jesse, any? No, okay. Aloha. <laughs>